since it's my first. And so I'm excited to uh, both be in attendance as well as presenting. Um, and I'm going to switch over here quickly to the presentation mode and we'll begin. So uh, a few things. Uh, I dropped into the chat there at the very beginning uh, a while back. Um, a, qu a general question, what are you hoping to come away with from this presentation? It helps me. Um, so if you have uh, a, a specific thing that you're looking for um, in a presentation like this one, just go ahead and type it in the chat. I'd love to uh, address that at some point in time while I'm presenting. Um, I hope that I'm coming in through clearly. I, I think I was when um, Shane and I were chatting earlier. So. Um, if I'm not, just let me know in the chat. This is Stories from the Blended Learning Classroom, Practical Applications from a District-Wide Moodle impl Implementation. I work for the Parkway School District in St. Louis, Missouri, right in the middle of the states. And um, it's an, ex an excellent place to go to school, an excellent place to teach. I'm a technology integration specialist. I was a former teacher. Uh, now I uh, support the work of teachers and students in the classrooms, uh, primarily uh, within a, a middle school and a high school in our in our district. I'll be talking a little bit about our district a little bit uh, later in the presentation. Um, so uh, if you want to connect with me, uh, DrewMcAllister.net is my website. Uh, on Twitter, I'm simply DrewMCA. And uh, let's go ahead and we'll just begin. My, my purpose here is generally to, to just tell stories of how we're using specific applications um, it within our context. So I hope that some of this will be applicable to you. I've just enjoyed the stories that I've heard throughout the conference. Um, just as a few um, overarching um, statements at the beginning, uh, we see Moodle as one uh, of a piece of many different tools that we have out there. Um, in general, we are looking for a platform from which we can build upon. Uh, Thomas Lasik has a wonderful Lego um, metaphor when he talks about Moodle and we found that very effective when communicating what Moodle is to our teachers. Uh, some of them um, are excited, some of them are um, hesitant just like the ones that you may work with. Um, but in general our context we have five high schools, we have about 18,000 students K-12. Our implementation of Moodle has been typically in grades 6 to 12. In most curricular areas we have curriculum coordinators and so um, the way that we roll this out is uh, one of our coordinators sees the value of the tool as something that they want to invest their own time, uh, talking time, when they speak with teachers about. So as soon as our curriculum coordinator has bought in, we um, pursue those teachers and uh, invite them to become part of the training team. And um, they come for training, they are trained, they become what we call course creators. That means they can create as many courses within our environment as they wish. And this encompasses most curricular areas um, with um, health and PE as well as fine arts being the only exceptions. So we have math teachers, we have physics teachers, we have com arts teachers of course as well as social studies teachers, foreign language, etc. We really wanted a blended approach. Um, we are face-to-face -face schools and um, that's a big part of our mission is to meet kids face-to-face, um, -to, -face, to talk, interact with them and, and be with them on a personal level. But we wanted to be able to extend that time to um, add to instructional um, and time on task. So Moodle was a way for us to extend our reach beyond the classroom um, in a very uh, standardized way. Because uh, we have, as many of you might, um, oh, hello, Neil, uh, summer co-op student. Great. Um, this will be a, a wonderful thing for you, I think. Uh, we're just going to go over very uh, surface level. But uh, we were looking for a, uh, a standard a way to deliver um, our uniform curriculum across um, our district uh, using one um, user interface. And so Moodle fit that need and uh, it was a, a great way to um, deliver some of our standardized curriculum in, in, a, in, a, in a way that's also flexible for the teacher's need. Uh, we've also allowed, loved the flexibility of Moodle, so when a teacher comes to me or to one of the other tech integration specialists and says, you know, I really need Moodle to do this, generally we're able to do it with some sort of plug-in. So um, we're excited. Uh, it's a, a wonderful tool and, and uh, it's doing good things for kids. The particulars of our installation, we're in version 1.9, uh, not on 2.0. That's been a big reason for me to, to, to listen in on the conversations at this conference. 
because we're looking to move that direction. Uh, primarily, we're sitting at 1.9 because of Nanogong, which is an amazing recording tool, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, now that when I when I just began uh, reading and, and really delving into the um, the Twitter feeds, uh, now that Nanogong has been moved to 2.0, we're excited uh, even more because that means that um, our teachers will have a, a very similar experience when we begin that transition. We were self-hosting, but decided that that was a little bit too much for our tech staff to, to keep up with, and so we are currently remote learner um, customers, and that's worked out really well for us. So uh, they've been very responsive and um, a good partner as we've moved forward. So um, what do we do in Moodle? Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about each of the um, activities and resources that have been helpful to us um, as I skim across the top. So um, as I intro this, um, and welcome to Joe. Uh, I just noticed you in the, the participants. Um, as I move through this, what I'd like you uh, to, to think about is um, so many ideas have been shared. I'm going to be sharing a few ways that we use these big three activities. But if you've noticed someone uh, speaking about these type of things earlier in the conference and one uh, an idea that I don't share, please, at the very end, we're going to have some time um, just at the end of this section to share those ideas. So please keep that in mind, um, something that uh, what are some great ideas that you've heard about these big three. All right, so the big three are things that um, lots and lots of our teachers are using in specific ways. And the first one is the forum. The first way that we use the forums, um, or a, a great way that um, we use the, the, the forums, is, is for peer review. Um, we are not subscribed to Google Apps yet. It's another thing that we are pursuing in our district that we are excited about. But um, sometimes you just need a, a, a place for kids to look at one another's work. And we've found that forums are wonderful places to do that. Um, and what you see before you, kind of in very small print there, you see Commerce Collaboration, and then you have a block, and then you have a, a series of forms. It's kind of messy. But um, uh, what I like about this idea is that for our Moodle installation, teachers can enroll kids from multiple classes into the same group. And so um, these are the, com the Sixth White com Communication Arts actually has two ComArts teachers within it. And so um, Mrs. Hensley and Mrs. Welker got together and said, well, we're going to build one course. We're going to enroll all of our kids. So that's something like, I mean, it's 150 kids in, in, in one course from two different teachers. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to split them up. So you can see groups A, B, C, D, etc. What we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, two kids from this period and two kids from this period are going to work together. And they're going to post their, their, their work and then they're going to comment. Each kid was able to ask one question, uh, whether they wanted input on their introduction, their body, or their conclusion. And then um, the, their partner students would go ahead and, and leave um, feedback. Why this was great, um, there's was a, there a number of different reasons why it's great. It's a wonderful, authentic audience that motivates students to um, write well and, and, and read well. But it's also a great way, um, in this Moodle way, um, with Google Docs, you have so many different complexities of sharing and, and keeping track of everything in that running list. Uh, for students this young, this seemed to work very well. They, they were able to identify their group very easily. They just copy and pasted their uh, text that they were working with in Word directly into the forum post, and the students were able to respond. Um, no groups were applied to, uh, even though it says Group A, there were no groups and groupings as settings. Um, applied to any of these activities. So even though I'm assigned to group A, when I'm done with my mandatory two comments on the two people that I was assigned to, to read, I could then find the work of my friends and of other people within my class and with, within other classes. And so what we saw was by putting the peer review inside of uh, the communication arts uh, course, and um, allowing students to have free access to any of the, the work of their peers was um, long-term engagement. Kids came back um, time after time after time to read the work of other people, to comment when they're not, they weren't required uh, for it. So it was like finding little Easter eggs. We've talked a lot about gaming um, with conditional activities. Um, this is a wonderful way 
to um, invite others to participate. So um, when you do forums, um, sometimes you don't have to group them. Uh, allowing them to have uh, open access has been great for us. In addition to the general, uh, what I would call a, a single simple discussion or a standard forum, uh, the, the key forum type, um, if you're not familiar with forums, there are a number of different types of forums that you can choose from. One of them is called the Q&A forum. And uh, on its simplest level, uh, the, the teacher asks a question, poses a prompt, and then students reply. Um, students cannot see the replies of their classmates until after they compose their own original idea and post it to the forum. And that's just been wonderful for those teachers in situations who really want students to uh, construct their own response to a prompt or a question prior to reading the, the responses of others. So that's been great. Um, one unique spin on that is uh, you can kind of see the WS motion maps for constant V. This is a physics teacher. And what he's done with the Q&A forms is he has decided, well, if this is the functionality of the form, how can I tweak that so that my students get some um, formative assessment practice, some self-assessment practice? So what he did was he posted his question, which was to solve a problem, and um, immediately replied to it with an attachment of his answers. So students who participate in this forum, they don't get the answers right away. But as soon as they post their original response, they will see at the very top his response with the answers. And they can check right away how close their answers are to what we could call a model or exemplar answer and then bring their questions about the discrepancies into class. So rather than waiting until um, the, the next day to find out the answer or um, coasting through all of their peers' answers to find out which one might be right, um, they have a quick reference and um, a, a, a spark to um, what, uh, what, what questions they might ask in the, in the coming day. So for him, the Q&A um, is not only a, a place for students to compose original thoughts, but also to test those thoughts against a model or an exemplar. So that's, that's worked out really well. Peer review, Q&A, and then finally, uh, galleries. We've noticed that um, teachers have uh, many students doing lots of digital work, um, much of it either poster form or um, like a, a PDF, something like that. And uh, they post these up over across their their classrooms, but they don't have enough room. They would love to show off everyone's work, but they just don't have the physical space. So for us, uh, what's great about forums is that, um, especially if you have a, if you can render whatever that digital product is in a, a JPEG or a movie file format, the forum will actually display that uh, that that, that uh, picture or the movie uh, in line. And so on the left hand side, you see. Um, a, a timeline project from one of our 8th grade students uh, wrestling with the idea of what is history. Well, we're going to start thinking about history by creating our own timelines. Uh, they just created it uh, in, in one of two or three different products. Those products exported to JPEG. They attached it to their forum post. And um, you're able to scroll down and see the timelines of every person within that class, which is wonderful and uh, doesn't require any work on the teacher's part. On the left-hand side, what we've noticed, and it might be a glitch in our system or um, for us, but it, it works great. Uh, we have, our students have available to them two browsers, Firefox and Internet Explorer. The um, Internet Explorer is our default. We ask students to, part, when they participate within Moodle activities, that they work in Firefox. I have one ex exception for that, and that is many of our students are creating movies either using Microsoft Movie Maker or uh, Windows Photo Story 3. And those programs create WMV files. Well, we've noticed that uh, if the students are viewing their forum posts within IE, within Internet Explorer, um, after they've attached those WMV files, they get a nice embedded player for every one of the forum posts. This has been great because uh, teachers who are burdened with creating uh, one investing time to do some wonderful digital storytelling, but also, you know, how do I show all this stuff that the students have created? So much of it is wonderful. Um, once again, back to Moodle, back to forums. If they've created it in um, any of these Microsoft products, they can attach the file to 
uh, a Moodle forum post and view one another's. We have suggested, and teachers have taken us up on it, that uh, students upload their work to this forum. They view as many as they'd like, select one or two that they think are um, especially noteworthy, and bring those as votes back to the classroom the next day. So instead of showing uh, my 30 different uh, digital stories, we have the three or four that are the, one, the, the best, and uh, we can take maybe the last 20 minutes of class one day to, to do that rather than stretching this out over two or three periods. So for us, the combination of peer review, the Q&A form, and the, the ability for forms to act as galleries has really been helpful um, to our students. In addition to forms, we also see lots of use in glossary. And boy, I've seen so many wonderful um, interpretations of how glossary works. So I'll just kind of gloss over mine because I'm interested to, to hear what you all have heard. Um, in its essence, our, the, our basic use of glossary has been the use of um, it as an encyclopedia. So as you can see, a student is assigned a specific uh, vocabulary term, um, and then they have to go find a picture, define it. And we have auto-linking enabled so that you can kind of see uh, up here in the first area, um, the, the word Han Dynasty has a, has a little gray portion to it. That's an auto link. So um, this specific course uses multiple glossaries. And they all link to one another because auto linking has been enabled. And this has been very uh, good for students who uh, are still trying to wrestle with the uh, amount of vocabulary that they have to um, synthesize over the course of a, of a semester or year, um, especially useful to our AP teachers because uh, those students are, are wrestling with lots and lots of vocabulary. Well, what teachers typically do is um, pair their use of the glossary with the random glossary entry block. And so this teacher goes in and changes the uh, random glossary entry every time that um, the chapter changes so that it's pulling only from the most recent um, glossary. And uh, this has been wonderful for our, our, both our teachers and our kids because it keeps those old vocabulary cycling through their working memory as they're studying the chapter and participating in activities on the Moodle site. In addition to the use of the glossary as an encyclopedia, um, enabling comments on a glossary allows this to not only be a collection of resources, but a collection of examples of those resources. For, uh, for an example, here is a glossary about literary terms. Uh, one of our English teachers set this up as a, as a dry run. And so she put in all of the literary terms that they would be covering throughout the year. Her task to students was to add a comment to each one of the uh, literary terms as they went through their independent reading that year. So in this case, um, under illusion, uh, a student might write one example is John's 100-yard touchdown pass was a Herculean effort. So in that case, that is an allusion to an earlier myth. And that was a, a quote from a book. So um, glossaries can be used not only as encyclopedias, but collections of examples uh, uh, of using a specific term or collecting, as, as I said, examples of, of uh, literary terms. So forums, glossaries, and then uh, the final of the big three, quizzes. Quizzes um, are take, take a while to, to create, but uh, because of the wonderful ability to share um, in our mid-sized district, sharing is a big, uh, a big deal and something that's very important to us. So if one teacher creates a quiz bank, that can be farmed out to multiple other teachers who teach the same thing throughout the district. And so for us, it's a, it's a big win. What we like about the quizzes uh, within Moodle, which are different than some of the free quiz makers that are out there, um, are the is the ability to attach inline multimedia. So in this case, uh, we have a final, and um, we need students to look at primary sources. Many of those primary sources are visual in nature. And so uh, in other quiz makers, we wouldn't be able to attach the picture to um, a specific quiz question, but with Moodle, we can. And so 
this has been a good solution, especially as we design common assessments that we want to deliver across multiple grade levels. Beyond um, the multimedia that we can put into uh, quizzes, they also allow our teachers uh, a great ease of grading. So um, this is a, uh, a, an essay test that you're looking at here. Um, when I was asking a teacher how she grades her, her essay questions on her quizzes, uh, she said, well, I, I set down all of the, the, the quiz um, papers in front of me, and then I read the, the first student's answer to question one, and then I flip to the next student, and I read their answer to question one, and the next question one, the next question one. And so I flip through all of them to, to get an idea about what are my students' understandings across the board, what's the baseline, and then I build from there. Um, what our teachers love about Moodle is that it deals with essays in the very same format. So I get to see all of the uh, answers to question one all at once in a scrolling window that I can very quickly um, go all the way down and see what everyone has written. So for our teachers, it really speeds up the ability to grade essay tests um, as they move on. And, and I've heard more things about rubrics, which I'm interested to see, but for right now, um, this is just specific feedback um, and grading specific essay questions. In addition to inline media and ease of grading, uh, I just finished up uh, a application of the quiz module, the quiz activity, uh, with a council with our counseling department. Um, our counseling department has new students register throughout the summer, and uh, but the counselors aren't there. These students, when they register, have to take specific exams, and uh, which will place them in different levels of math and social studies and, um, and English. And they're looking for a way to automate it. And quizzes are a wonderful way to do that. So we have uh, graded quizzes that uh, these students take. Um, but we had to collect, in some way, the uh, students' information. Um, and we certainly could have done that with the database module. And if, if I knew more about databases, I would have led the teachers through that. But they take a little bit longer for me to understand and for me to teach to teachers. So uh, what we did was we used a quiz to collect student information. And um, it was not graded. There was no um, work to, to be done in terms of grading for, for that quote unquote quiz. But it was just a wonderful way to, to set up a series of boxes that students could just fill in with their personal information and that teachers who might be unfamiliar with, um, with Moodle, but who are department heads, and so they're part of this process, um, could very easily just click on the quiz, find the student's name, access that student's information uh, from the, uh, the results area, and then, um, and then um, contact the, the student for follow-up as they looked at the actual uh, results of the, the other quizzes. So for us, whether it be a common ex exam or an essay exam or a, a, a non-exam, just a, an information collection tool, quizzes have been, have been wonderful and, and teachers are using them a lot. So those are the big three. I'd like to take just a few moments and uh, those of you who are uh, listening, uh, Céline, uh, I'm sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing it, but, but welcome. Um, if you could just type in um, a few things that, um, or just one thing, what's one great idea of a use of a forum, a use of a glossary, or a use of a quiz that you've heard through um, either this conference or um, something that uh, you've employed yourself? So give me one idea from the big three that you've enjoyed. Uh, a what if forum, Joe? That's great. And, ooh, tandem e-learning, Celine. Uh, wow, I'd like to know more about that. Oh, that's great. But uh, French and American students using um, e. Moodle as an EFL tandem learning in foreign culture. Great, like, a, like an ePAL solution.
Yeah, currently we, we do not allow students um, beyond our district to participate in our Moodle courses, um, which forces us to do things like ePals to, to do that sort of uh, interactive feature. But what a wonderful way to use a forum. Um, oh, yeah, Joe puts in the, the idea glossary, build vocabulary lists, and rate or evaluate peers. Yeah, we haven't used rating too much, but it's a wonderful tool to especially help them understand how to put in a good glossary entry. Carly says, actually, I want to work on different ideas for using the glossary. That's good. And then, oh, instant messaging. Yeah, <laughs> for our learners uh, in 612, instant messaging became something that we couldn't, uh, couldn't allow anymore. So <laughs> we, we had it on for a little bit, but we had to turn it off. <laughs> Carly, thanks. So other people are having the same the same thing. Yeah, it it is too bad, but um, it's more of a developmental thing. So they'll they'll get they'll get their 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 IMing other places, I guess. And then Joe writes, "Have your teachers looked at quiz question building role? I have not, and I'm not sure if it's available in 1.9 or or only two. I, Joe, I just heard about that for the first time in this conference. Um, that seems like such a cool thing um, for students to build their own questions. I think that's what you're what you're, what you're talking about. I imagine that we would be able to tweak the settings in 1.9 to allow that, but but um, I, the versions that I've heard that happening in was was two. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to try it again. Saline says they used instant messaging to complete a task. Yeah, that's great. So I'll wait for Saline to to finish typing and then uh, we'll move on. Thanks for the great ideas. Okay, great. We'll just, we'll just uh, move to the, the next section. Then. So I, I entitled this section the 5 Minute 5. These are the, the five um, activity types that our teachers are using somewhat. Um, some good things happening with them. Um, there are some constraints around each one of them that I'll talk about. And then uh, we'll do a, a great big vote where um, you all will be able to uh, choose of the, the, big, the top three in the five minute five, which one you like best. Okay, so uh, the chat. Um, chat is great. Um, our teachers typically use it, the ones who are using it, are using it as office hours. So you set up a chat, um, you hide it so that students can't participate in it until, uh, but you, you label it. So you give, a, give it a label that says, you know, this is our open office hours from 7 to 8 on this date. Uh, typically it's prior to a large exam or, um, or a, a, a big, a big um, performance assessment of some type. But the reason we don't use it too much, I'm going to point it out right here, is the wonderful beep button. And if you've ever used um, the chat with middle schoolers, you will you will know all about the beep button. Uh, for our for our kids, it just it's just a little bit too much for them, um, and it, it's kind of silly to ask a teacher to tell kids to mute all their machines. So uh, the beep is something that keeps us from using chat within the classroom setting. However, it's a wonderful thing when we talk about um, the office hours because essentially a teacher can uh, unhide the chat and then minimize the window and just go about her regular business. And she doesn't have to monitor that chat. It's all being recorded. Uh, but if students do need her, they can hit the beep button. Her machine beeps at her, and she goes to uh, visit with them in the, in the, in the chat. So um, not a lot of teachers are using it. Uh, many students uh, prefer other methods to, of, of contact. But the ones who have have been pleased by it. And uh, this is how we use chat. Um, the only other way has been within the classroom used as like a five-minute um, exit activity if the teacher doesn't have another um, activity plan for the last five minutes of class. Next is choice. Um, if you're not familiar with what choice is, it is a one question multiple choice selection. Um, in this case, the example before us is uh, each of the students had to, they were studying a, a number of different countries within uh, South America, and, uh, or I guess this is probably Central America here. Uh, and what a, a student did was they gave a presentation on that South American country face-to-face, -face, or Central American country face-to-face -face with their classmates. 
But the Moodle activity was to come and to vote where you would want to live and where you would not want to live. So this is a closing activity um, and students were able to just select which place they wanted to and then uh, there was a celebration for the place that was voted um, most desirous. Um, so those, that was kind of what, what this teacher used choice for. We also have teachers who use choices and make, um, they, uh, uh, in, in the choice settings, you're able to limit the number of responses per uh, selection. So um, we had a teacher who had only a certain amount of books for an independent reading. And those, uh, instead of um, trying to figure out the paperwork of who would get what, book, what she did was she opened, she told her students that a choice would open up at a specific time and then when the students went home uh, they knew that the choice was going to open up sometime that night um, and be available uh, during the, the, the next day and basically it was first come first serve. So if you knew that you really wanted to read a specific book uh, for your independent reading this next uh, eight weeks or whatever, um, you, you made sure you went to the Moodle, you clicked on the book of your choice, and if that book had already been uh, filled, the, the amount of books were already taken, it would kick you in air and say, you can't choose this one, choose another. So you had to have your second choice ready in the wings so you could select that. And uh, that was just a great way to classify and group her kids in a way that uh, was dependent upon them. And so um, the choice is a, is a great thing to do and uh, it allows students to both show their own votes but also to divide students into groups if you need to. So chat choice and then questionnaire. There are some amazing survey tools. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big um, Google Forms user and we have people who love SurveyMonkey and Zoomerang and those type of um, survey creators. Uh, so one might ask, you know, why would I use a questionnaire? Why, why use a survey within Moodle? I think the, the, uh, the key to, to answering that question is whether you um, need to determine that um, a student has participated or not. For uh, a questionnaire within Moodle, I'll pull up the point pointer here, down at the bottom you'll see this is actually uh, within your administration block you have a link that says reports and um, one of the reports that you can generate is called a participant report and I'm not interested in either of these surveys that are up here about what a specific student answered, but I am interested to know whether they participated or not. So I can follow up with them and tell them this is something they need to do. And so with other survey generators, I mean, how, how am I going to know? Um, I could have one kid fill it out three times for himself and his two friends. But with a questionnaire delivered through Moodle, I'm a, I have my participant report available and I can tell who has participated and who has not. Another great um, way that we've seen questionnaire used, which is something that um, our that other survey tools have not done um, as well, is taking on a huge volume of um, responses. So what you're able to do with questionnaire is uh, get as lots and lots of kids involved in a specific questionnaire. So for for our purposes, one of our high schools had something called a trusted adult survey. Uh, what this does, what this survey is all about is students um, select from a, a long list of teachers which ones they would go to if they had a specific need in their own personal life or saw something within the school community they would want to report. And um, this has taken some arduous time uh, away from our counselors in, um, in our history and so what Moodle's questionnaire allowed us to do is create a one single question that was a, a, a multiple answer question, and so they could just a checkbox area. And they could a student logged in, went to the questionnaire, checked off the teachers, clicked submit, and we were able to gather data from 1,500 individuals. And then, um, since we can export as a CSV, we just pulled that into um, we pulled it into Excel and uh, disaggregated the data. We were able to send reports to each of the teachers of which kid um, picked you and which kid didn't, because it's all ones and zeros. So um, it was a very efficient way to use the questionnaire, and we could once again generate a participant report. We know which kids participated, which kids did not, and we were able to, to do that quite quickly and efficiently. So 
for us questionnaire with big data as well as where participant participation is important we like using the questionnaire chat choice questionnaire wiki wikis are great um, I'm a, I am a frequent user of both wiki spaces and Google sites uh, I love wikis for collaborative creation and the wiki tool within uh, Moodle has been decent but uh, we run and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the differences in Moodle 2.0 but with 1.9 uh, we ran into many difficulties about you know who who said what when um, who created which piece and how we're going to, to deliver credit so this is a, a, a good example of how it worked well in this case it's a Greek inspired poetry it's an online annotation project small groups kids selected a poem typed it in on the left and then each student uh, highlighted a specific section that had some sort of inspiration from a mythology or Greek culture highlighted it in a specific, col uh, specific color and then added their annotations to the right you'll see that uh, be below each couple sentences we see the initials of each student and that's how we know um, who is going to be giving given credit for this specific annotation this works especially well for the um, students who are functioning within honors classes um, but, but any sort of level would, would work for us but for us if we're going to use the wiki we have to use colors we have to use annotations uh, so that our assessments are accurate and then finally workshop um, workshop is something we're just wading into um, it's a wonderful tool um, the way that I like to describe it is it's a wonderful tool to teach students to be good assessors um, assessors of others and by um, practice um, assessing other people I become a better um, assessor of myself and my own work so um, more than anything better more than um, a grading tool more than um, a way to collect and distribute papers workshop for me uh, is a wonderful tool to teach kids a good um, in, in a practical way how to become better writers themselves um, and so we've used workshop maybe two or three times in the high school that I work in um, what we found is that our, our expectations as people doing it doing the work were not the the, the uh, realities of the system we wanted to have students walk in submit their papers and then grab the papers of other people in the class at the same time and that's not the way it works um, at least in 1.9 the way that workshop works in our experience is that students walk in they submit their papers and then they walk out um, and do some of their class activity because it takes about an hour for the system to say okay I've got all of the papers in this workshop um, and now after an, after that hour period of time the system says okay now I'm going to redistribute them to everybody else so for us we had to wait that hour to make it actually work and once we knew that 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 worked out just fine it's just we had to had to learn that sort of through practice so that's that's my handy tip about using the workshop it's a great assessment tool um, teaching students assessment practices but um, I would suggest that you use it um, with the with the idea that you're gonna have to wait an hour after the students submit their first uh, submission although that may, may change in, in 2.0 and that's what I'm looking forward to, to learning more about okay so uh, that was a five minute five um, and so what I'd like you to do right now is I'm going to open up a, a poll here on the left hand side you'll see it there uh, stretch that out so if you would go ahead um, and select your favorite on the left hand side and then tell me why it can be one of the big ones it can be one of the what we have experienced as, as um, the five minute five but select your favorite on the left hand side and then um, type why you like it into the chat Okay, it's a dead even heat with forums and glossary. But glossary is pulling away. We only get five votes, so uh, if you've never experienced Moodle, I'd, I'd 
suggest you just select a favorite based on the information I gave you. And then and say why you like it. We have three active people in the votes. Okay, Celine says because student forums, because students can reread them afterwards and work on ideas in their own rhythm. Great. Oh, another vote for forums. Joe says glossary has a lot of options. I think you can have students do a lot of different things within the glossary. So, one for forum, one for glossary. Lynn and Carly must have put in their votes because they're typing right now. I think I don't know if Neil's still around, but uh, Neil, if you are, uh, vote. You're going to be the tiebreaker. Lynn says haven't really tried the glossary for different things, so I'd have to go to the forum. Celine says that she agrees with Joe, and Lynn says although I I use the quiz a lot, great, and not just for assessment. So Lynn, if you could, could you share one one non-assessment use of the quiz that's worked for you? Student practice. Great. Yeah, that's a that's a good student practice in math. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that formative work. Carly says, I like the glossary for encouraging students to create information that would be available throughout the course. So they would be supplying information to everyone. Yeah, that's a great thing to do. Um, so the idea of using a glossary to create for one another to really become uh, collaborative um, co-learners in the course. It's great. All right, I'm waiting for Carly. Carly, go ahead and finish typing there. I'm going to pull that quiz down and get ready to continue. And Carly says, I really wanted to use the Wiki and Moodle, but it was a bit too hard for many of the students to really understand. I agree. I, I do hope that uh, in Moodle 2.0, the, the intuitive um, interface would be would be back and that uh, students would be able to, to use the, the forum or not the forum but but the wiki in a more productive fashion so um, I'll be <laughs> it's Memorial Day weekend here so uh, I haven't been able to get into the, the archives as much as I want but that's something I'll be searching for as I go all right so uh, as we move on um, if it wasn't their first experience it might have been easier yeah exactly so if, if they had more, if we could walk people through step by step, it would probably be better. And that's one of the, the nice things about our situation is that uh, we see our students each and every day. So um, we can have some of that um, literacy type instruction on the, the specifics of the tool so students can adapt to it quickly. Okay, so um, just a few things that are more resource oriented, um, but um, I like to categorize them this way. We have specific tools that we are using in our Moodle that are about individualization and differentiation. So student experiences can be collaborative and, um, and productive for their unique needs um, as, as learners. So we, we talk about an online Dropbox, essays and teacher feedback, audio everywhere, and grouping students. That's what we're going to talk about in just a few moments. So the first is the online Dropbox. A lot has been talked about, um, about assignments during the conference. I'm excited about having a single assignment type and just being able to manipulate that to my, my own uh, desires and needs. We use the assignment a lot like a Dropbox, and, uh, but it's a, it's a, a one-way Dropbox, right? A, a, a student submits their file, the, student, the teacher grades it, and that's kind of where the interaction ends. Um, but for us, that, that works really well in many different situations. So what you're seeing right here is a screenshot of a, a teacher. All she wanted was a but was a quick way to um, view student files. 
Um, if you've been a, a teacher in a classroom, this is a common problem. Um, I have students with flash drives, or they email me this something. Um, all I want is a place to pull up their stuff so that when they pre when they present, we don't have this shuffling going on between people. And so whether it's a PowerPoint or, or a movie file is, is in this screenshot, the assignment Dropbox is great for a face-to-face -face class because students submit things and um, their presentation materials so that when it's their turn to present, the teacher has his or her Moodle up, the student can click on their presentation, it opens, and we're ready to go. So whether it's this or even a Google Doc or a, um, a link to a Prezi presentation, um, putting uh, even putting um, cloud-based assignments into Moodle is a great thing because we're able to um, put um, we're able to arrange all of those within a, a convenient gradebook format that works for teachers as they want to send feedback. So whether it's a Google Doc or um, a Prezi presentation or something else that was created online, often an online text assignment is great just to put it, push in the, uh, the URL and then a uh, teacher can grade it from there. So an online Dropbox is great. We also use uh, the inline feedback a lot. Um, if you're not familiar with online um, text assignments, one of the elements that you can select is the ability for a teacher to, um, to uh, automatically give feedback within the lines of a student's um, product. We use this, um, even though we have teachers using Google Docs with their classes, they will select to use Moodle's online text to deliver their own feedback, especially on a final product. That keeps all of the, 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 the feedback within a, um, an, a teacher and student only conversation rather than a Google Doc, which can expand to a larger conversation with uh, people, whoever has been shared with that, with that um, document. So inline feedback, um, when you create an online text assignment, look for that add comments in line and you can, um, you'll have this ability to uh, type in your work, uh, type in inside a student's work. And so this is what this teacher has done. You can see that uh, he or she has added different words or changes within a different type of, um, type of color. So online Dropbox, inline feedback, and then audio everywhere. We have something called the NanoGong plugin. Um, that's okay, Carly. Uh, thanks so much for, for hanging out with us for a little bit. Um, so Audio Everywhere is the ability for us to have students record and teachers record anywhere that they can get an HTML bar. I'll zoom in here for, for a moment. And this is the NanoGong plugin. I'll, I'll just go ahead and type that in. You most likely heard of this um, in, uh, th if you've been um, listening to the conference in any of the multimedia sessions. NanoGong is great. Uh, it's super easy. Um, you click one button and click record and you're recording right away. You click stop. You can replay it as many times as you want. We are a school district has, that has used VoiceThread for a lot of different things. And um, it's, that's, that's also great, but we've found that this is even easier for our students. So they, we have many uh, foreign language teachers who are delivering some of their, um, some of their oral tests through this version. So if I back up just a bit, you'll notice at the top um, that there are a series of speaker icons. That's where the teacher has uh, left her own prompts. And then a student, when it's their turn, will come to the essay area here. We're just using an online text assignment to collect this data. They just use the, uh, the speaker icon, it allows them to record it, and then stop and and play as many times as they want, and then submit what they feel is their best um, uh, their best submission. The nice thing about NanoGong, especially from a foreign language perspective, is um, you can see on the player whether I'm recording or whether I'm playing back. I get these two arrows, one to the left and one to the right, and there's a little X and then 1.0 here. What that is, is the ability to actually slow down the recording. It doesn't slow it so much far down that it distorts the audio, but if you're listening to your teacher or a, a native speaker asking you a question or giving you a prompt, you can slow it down just a bit 
so you can make that a little bit more intel intelligible. So um, we've really liked that as, as a feature of NanoGong, but the ability to record um, anywhere we can find an HTML bar is amazingly impressive. Um, so for us, that's been it's been a great thing. I did attend um, Justin Hunt's presentation on Poodle, which is uh, an audio and video recorder for Moodle, and I'm I'm very impressed, and I'll be looking into that more um, as as we go forward because video is really the next step. So uh, for us, NanoGong for audio has been a simple and effective solution uh, as we look forward to video recording within our, our Moodle environment. We'll be looking at uh, Justin's Poodle product. It looks great. So in addition to that, at the, at the very end of this uh, differentiation, we couldn't um, leave without talking about groups and groupings. Um, could I get a show of hands quick? Um, who has used groups and groupings? Just very quickly. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Adobe Connect, um, you can either, so you can either type it, yep, some groups, good. I didn't, Celine hasn't tried it yet, and um, Neil's kind of getting his feet wet. So, uh, so some of us have used groups, some of us haven't. We use groups for two primary reasons, at least with the teachers that, I, that I'm using. You can see over here on the left-hand side, reason number one, we have students with individual educational profiles, or IEPs. And um, those students, uh, as part of their IEP, they, they need modified assessments. So if a teacher is delivering any assessment within Moodle, um, those students have to be in a different, being, they have to get a different quiz. What's nice about Moodle is we're, by using groups and groupings, we're enabling our teachers to deliver different content to two different groups of kids, and yet neither kid knows the kid next to him is taking a different test. So, oh, Neil, you have to use some. Great. Um, so for us, groups and groupings has been, uh, has been key to meeting the needs of our, our kids who have these individual educational profile requirements. And that's what you can kind of see on the, on the left-hand side. Um, Zurich grouping being the typical, and then modified being those tests that have been modified. We also have some teachers exploring how to use this for standards-based grading. So um, specific group is um, you're promoted every time that you move into a different area. And uh, I think conditional um, activities will be able to um, solve those even, even better than what we're doing with groups and groupings right now. One unique way that we are using groups and groupings is over here. You can kind of see that in this drop down of all the groups, you'll notice there's only one kid per group. Why do we use this? Well, as I was talking about earlier with the assignment type, your, um, your assignments are typically one way, student to teacher, and then teacher to student, and it's only for that one interaction. So the student can't follow up with additional edits. But if you include a student in his own individual group and then apply um, separate group mode to, say, a forum uh, work, that means that each student has his or her own forum and becomes a two-way street only between the teacher and the kid. And so it's like enabling messaging between a teacher and a student, only it's available only to, um, only to the teacher. So for us, this has been a, a neat way to create like a journaling uh, opportunity for kids or to um, create, um, uh, we've used it for ePals. So it'll be two students um, from different schools that'll be talking with one another. And so um, groups and groupings has been a uh, neat and creative thing for us. Well, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to move through this last section briefly. Uh, organization and design. Labels, web pages, books, and links. Our first goal when we um, meet with teachers, and we have them for about 12 hours to two days to give them background on what blended learning is and then how Moodle can help them affect a um, an interactive and engaging blended learning experience for their kids. We don't want this on the right side. We want this on the left. So for our teachers, we know, we all know, if you've used Moodle, the ability to add um, 
uh, a file, upload a file or, or link to a web page is great, but it creates a long laundry list of activities and interactions that um, is not healthy for kids or helpful to, uh, to learning. So we uh, spend some time showing different examples of how um, the use of topics, of colors, of web pages. If I have lots of links, I always put them into a web page, not just, I think we call these pages now in, in Moodle 2. Um, design is a big deal when we're talking about interactivity online. And so for us, it's been, it's been a, a, a growing process. But if you're working with teachers, feel free to share this slide with them. Um, this is an important thing. And it, it's really something that we only we have to see lots of before we internalize it. So web pages, labels, and links, the big deal behind these is making your Moodle page useful. And then finally, books. Um, more than any other resource, books have been helpful for our librarians. We've seen some wonderful work by librarians within our district where they enter into partnerships. Um, the library is becoming increasingly digital, uh, it's obvious. Um, and what teachers have, what our teacher librarians have seen is that that means um, sometimes a, a, a lightening of the foot traffic that's uh, moving within that library space. So that means, you know, the librarians become advocates for the, the, the work that their um, curation tools can provide. And uh, one way to do that is to um, advocate, especially towards those teachers who have bought into Moodle. Because books create these wonderful experiences that students, when they are doing their research, they come to the Moodle, the space where they've been working for some time now, and then um, they are able to select from their materials, both digital as well as inside the library space itself. So it's been a wonderful advocacy um, tool for our librarians and a, a great tool for our, our teachers who have multiple resources that they want to share. So finally, the future. And for us, the future is, um, is sharing. PLCs are, are a big deal for us and um, Moodle because we have put in a specific plugin called the sharing cart. I'll put that into the chat. The sharing cart has been key for us because it allows us to uh, freedom from the import-export um, back and forth that has to happen in a typical Moodle installation for content to move from one course to another. The sharing cart allows us to pull from pull one item from one course and put it any other course that we want. So for our teachers who are working in PLCs, when they see wonderful elements in one place, they can quickly and easily port them to, to another. Sustainability and growth is, is um, important. We are looking to move into elementary and wondering how are we going to do that. Um, we have, a, just like every, everybody else, we have uh, shrinking, shrinking staffs for instructional technology and um, with the same amount of teachers. So how do we uh, do that? And then finally, how do we migrate to 2.0? So if any of you have answers to those sort of things or you can point me to a person, I'd love to, to have a chat about that. But in conclusion, these are the stories that have made up uh, my experience of, of this district-wide implementation of Moodle. And uh, thanks so much for the ideas that you've shared. And um, I look forward to bumping into some of you um, online some other time. Thanks again. And then I'm going to change this into the Q&A area right now. So if you, if you want, you can stick around and, and ask questions. Otherwise, um, it's been great to, to have you in the chat room and in, in the room in general. I will talk with you later.